Hi, it's Mike Stevenson here. In today's video, we're going to talk about doing stuff for free on Azure. Before we jump in today, um, let's have a quick thanks to the sponsor, Turbo360, who helped me produce the videos and um, support the channel and help me grow the channel. So please check out um, Turbo360. Now, the background to today's video is um, Many people who follow the channel will know I've talked a lot about um, how to optimize costs and manage costs on Azure recently. Um, I think it's a big thing I've been interested in and a lot of customers have asked me about. Um, <clears throat> so some of the content I've been doing had been spotted by um, Stephen and Frank, who you can see um, down here. So Stephen and Frank run a podcast called The FinOps Guys, and they do some really great content, um, a lot of stuff in the uh, in the AWS space, but they reached out to me because they saw some of the videos and stuff I've been doing and wanted to kind of chat to somebody in the Azure space. So they invited me onto the podcast, and we talked about um, free stuff on Azure. So you can see here we've got the bit that we talked about and I really enjoyed meeting the guys um, they're both really good to chat to and it, it was good for me to sort of be in Azure focused predominantly it was good to me for me to chat to people who focus maybe a bit more in the AWS space and we kind of share ideas and bounce ideas around something I always enjoy doing but in the podcast um, we talked about the free tier and in advance I was thinking about some of the solutions that I'd done I've done historically with um, free tiers on Azure, and I thought I'd do a follow-up video just to talk about what I had in my head as we led up to that podcast, which I thought people might find interesting. So in the podcast, the first question that I asked the guys is, well, when you talk about free, what do you mean by free? Because there's a number of different ways you can access free stuff on Azure. And um, that'll influence kind of what you're already doing, what kind of organization you are. So the first one is if you're coming in as a brand new user, um, you can get free stuff on Azure. So you've got a combination of free credits that you can use for the first 30 days when you're trying stuff out. You also get some free services on Azure as well, which we'll look at in a moment. So some of the things are that some services are always free. Some things are free up to a certain amount and for a certain period of time. So we'll look at those services. But then the other thing I said to the guys, well, look, you also have to remember there's there's different offers down at the bottom here that mean you may be paying some money as an individual or an organization, but you also get some free stuff that you can leverage. So free doesn't always have to be a brand new user. It could be that you know, you've got things your organization may have access to, but you're not already taking advantage of. So some of the big ones would be if your organization has MSDN, now you can get MSDN either directly or if you're a partner, you get access to MSDN through partner benefits. Um, those give you MSDN credits that your developers can use for certain things. So you're talking in the region of about $100, $150 a month, something like that worth of credits that developers can access and the, the key things to make sure you're taking advantage of those credits so developers who need to do proof of concepts or try things out or just learn how the technologies work they're a perfect use case for that you also have things like if you're in if you have access to an azure sponsorship so there's different ways azure sponsorship can happen things like if you're an influencer or an mvp you often get access to them but there's other ways people can access Azure sponsorship. So it's something to look into whether you would be eligible for it. And then there can be you know, ways you can get an allowance of Azure credits to be able to use. If you're a student and you're learning Azure, there's offers for, um, for students where you can get some free credits to learn how the technology works. That's really great if, you're, if you can qualify for that, especially if you're a young person trying to get into the IT industry from, from university. There's some great ways to help you learn there. There's also things um, like ISV offers. So it might be the case that you buy an ISV pack from Microsoft and that'll come with a number of benefits, which often would include Azure credits. So from, from my side, having worked with a few ISVs before, um, I found that you know you might pay, so you may pay a couple of thousand pounds, you get a bunch of licenses for stuff, but often you'll get an amount of Azure credits that'll be beyond what the... The original benefit cost you so there's, there can be some good advantages there to make sure that you're aware of them 
Um, action packs are really great on as well. So even if you're a small consultancy, um, you can buy action pack, which gives you an allowance of licenses for things like Office 365 and licenses for your know, software on VMs, but also it includes um, Azure credits. And then also if, you, if you're a partner, you can be accessing partner benefits, which give you a lot of Azure credits. So the question is, you know, do you know what things you could be eligible for? And if you are eligible, make sure that you're taking advantage of getting access to them and then use them for something effective. So the question um, next becomes, what can I do with, with these free credits? So if we look, um, I'll just bring the screen up here, some of the free services that you can get on Azure. So sometimes we forget that this page is here and we'll spot a couple of key things. So if you notice things like um, Azure Advisor, so that's telling you about recommendations and best practices. That's something that's free always. I tend to find some of these advisory um, services they tend to be the ones that are in the always free tier and then things like api management so if you notice with api management you get a million calls a month on the consumption tier um always for free so if you think about you know what first off i would say the guys that's a really good um offer there because api management's often viewed as a really premium feature that companies are used to paying a lot of money to buy but actually if you're a small business a million calls a month might be a long way past what you would need to have. So you could actually get API management giving you all those advanced features, but you may get it completely for free always because you're below a million calls a month. Now, different uh, as we go down the list here, you know, you'll see things like app service. So you'll get an amount of compute with an amount of storage that you can utilize. Um, you know, some of these things like um, you'll spot some of them have like a 12 month duration on here and then if we go down for things like funk actually cosmos db was a really good one so there we had um thousand request units per second for the for a provisioned account always so you, again if you had your api management and you had a cosmos db they could work quite well together and they could cost you nothing for a really small application Azure DevOps is quite a good one, so you can get a free allowance for five users, um, which will let you do, you know, advanced things like CI, CD pipelines, Git repos, and that kind of thing. And then as we get right down the bottom here, you know, we had things like functions comes up here. I don't know where that is now. Past it. So million requests a month for functions. So some really good stuff in here that we can take advantage of now. What I um what I wanted to do next was say, right, what can I do with that free allowance? So I was thinking about an example project in the past where we did a proof of concept that became production. This was a real world scenario. So before we started the project, there was an existing process where people would submit invoices in different formats. The um the manual processing to process those invoices took a lot of time. There was a desire to look at automating it. So what we try to do is create a prototype of a partner portal where partners could upload the invoices that customers submit to them. And then those invoices would vary by um, based on the different partner who submitted them. But can we process the invoices, load them into the CRM system? And the desired outcome was that for the partner, it was a quicker time to get payment at a lower cost of processing those uh, those invoices. So the architecture beforehand would look a bit like this. So we've got our partner over here submitting the invoices. They would come previously via post, email, fax. There's a big time delay till they get to us. Then somebody has to manually process them, scan them in, type in the details of them. They end up in Dynamics CRM over here where they start getting processed. And eventually, you know, after a period of time, payment goes back to the partner who reimburses the customer. So what we look to do is um, see if we can build a service in Azure that creates a portal for people to be able to submit invoices. Now, proof of concept on Azure is a perfect scenario here. So we could build this application using all of the free services that are on Azure. And if you're doing a proof of concept, the idea is, can we try this application out 
create something that looks like it would fly in the real world. But if it, if the business idea fails, we can bin the application, ditch all of the resources, and sort of minimize the amount of money that we've had to spend on Azure. So for example, here we could build a website that was hosted in Azure Static Web Apps. We could have, um, from the browser, API calls could go to API management, which then forwards onto Azure Functions, which does the back end for our API. So this is where all of our hard work happens, processing the invoice. Uh, invoices we could have key vault could be used for secret storage for the function app so we're putting in you know good security practices here we could use cosmos db would be the back end so we could store the documents after we've processed them um you know we could have some data about managing the customers and the users and that kind of thing we could use cognitive services to help us process these invoices so we could sort of do text recognition in images and that kind of thing. And then once we finish processing the data, we could put it into storage. And then the idea was that a logic app could trigger from storage and that could do the integration into dynamic CRM. So everything on here offers a free tier that would be scalable up to the size of a proof of concept to prove the idea works. But then the beauty of it was actually with these services, if the idea does fly, then we can just scale it up and we can start paying a little bit more money and that, that project could become a productionized system without too many changes to it. And actually, for, you know, for a small customer, the idea might be, this architecture might just work based on the level of load you're getting. You know, you might get quite big invoices, but you just get a few a month. That could work just as well. Now, one of the quite cool things with Azure, if we think about the, the different um, services we used in that architecture. So web apps, uh, static web apps was to serve web pages. We get 100 gigabytes per, uh, per month. API management and functions, we were getting a million requests a month. Key Vault, 10,000 requests. So obviously with Key Vault with function apps, you're probably caching those secrets anyway, so you wouldn't need to refresh them very often. Um, Cosmos DB, the free account, was giving us that 400 request units per second. Blob storage, we've got quite a bit. I guess the one that's probably the lowest here is the, the Logic App consumption was 4,000 actions per month. But we're probably only processing two or three actions per invoice once they've been saved to storage in that architecture. We trigger the event, we um, <clears throat> we you know we get the blob, we load it into CRM. There's probably not that much work there. Now, if we're developing the solution, one thing we we didn't really have because we we're talking about Azure, but VS Code you can get for free to build the application in. You can use Azure DevOps, we mentioned earlier, so we can take the free tier, gives us a number of users, manage a repo, an allowance of pipelines to deploy our solution. And then the Computer Vision API was giving us the um, 5,000 transactions per month for image to text. Now, when we did this, this architecture, maybe there's a couple of things changed now that you might explore that were different. You might use some of the more advanced AI features if you productionize it and stuff like that. But I think a lot of this is still viable as of when we originally did that project. Now, if we go beyond the um, the core architecture in, in this box here, we start thinking about what are the other things Azure gives us that can really help us. So things like Azure Monitor has a free tier, cost management has a free tier, security center has a free tier, we get the activity logs, and we even can get a free tier on Endra ID to be able to give us you know, authentication for users and that kind of thing. So we go beyond the core application, we go into these more advanced governance and monitoring features. We're still extending our architecture, but for our proof of concept particularly, we're still keeping it at the free tier level. Again, these services, some of them would be free all the time, such as um, cost management and security, but some of them would scale for things like Azure Monitor. If you, you know, if you went beyond the free tier, you would just start paying eventually. We mentioned Azure DevOps, so here's what it would look like if we had Azure DevOps over on the side here where our developer checks in. They can manage work items to help them manage backlogs of features to build. We have our DevOps pipeline detecting changes and can deploy our architecture out here. So we could, you know, we could use an advanced scenario like infrastructure as code with Bicep or Terraform. 
to provision the resources. We could also just use the deployment of code into the function apps, into the logic apps, etc. Now, with the free tiers, um, we do carry a few risks we need to think about. So a lot of that um, was running on a consumption tier, so things like the functions and the logic apps and the API management. We said we get a million requests a month. Now, if you start going beyond that limit, you'll start paying for it. So you have to think about how am I going to manage that? You know, if you're, if you're on a free tier where you haven't um, haven't allowed it to go past the kind of the free tier, so you can, you can configure it, you'll, you know, particularly something like an MSDN, if you're not going past your free credits, your services will stop. So you need to think, do you want them to stop or do you want them to start charging your card if they go beyond that? So that's one of the things you need to think about. You can mitigate that by monitoring your costs in reducing spending caps on certain types of subscriptions. You can do throttling patterns if you wanted to limit things like requests to your API and that kind of thing and how those requests might hit your back ends and process um, additional invoices coming in, for example. So if we want to then take this proof of concept to production, um, this is one of the things I like about this architecture. We, we can scale it up, we can change the SKU from a consumption SKU to a, um, a standard or premium SKU. We can also just, if it was consumption, we can just let it use more and pay for it on a pay-as-you-go basis. There's a number of different options for the different um, Azure resources that we had here. If we want to productionize it as well, we may have other things that come into play that we hadn't thought about previously before. We were really just pure native cloud thinking about the you know, kind of the PaaS services, um, but we might want to start doing things like private endpoints, network integration, enhanced security scenarios. So there we may choose to change the, the SKU that some of our services are on. So the big changes are probably going to be in things like the API management and the, um, the app service level. You probably want to have um, higher priced plans to be able to integrate them with networks. And then other things may, you know, things like the storage or um, Cosmos DB may be a bit simpler for doing the price, uh, the private endpoints. But, the, the, you know, this is the thing where proof of concept production, you've proven the business idea works so that when you want to bring in these more advanced features later, you can just do that and you can take a, an increase of cost because you want that more advanced feature. So hopefully um, that video is interesting to people just to talk about what can you do with some of the free um, free services on Azure. I hope this is a really nice um, follow-up to that podcast, just showing a little bit more of the thinking that I had when we were chatting. Um, I'd really recommend starting to follow Stephen and Frank's podcast just to keep up to speed with um, what's going on in the FinOps world. And I think you, you might find that really interesting. I um, hope everybody has a great week and hopefully see some people at the Integrate Summit next week too. Thank you.